This is tritium. Well, actually, that's just a tritium gaslight capsule. Unfortunately, I won't be showing any experiments today, but I'll get into that later. This is merely the radionuclide presentation video, so I will provide the following impulses just to keep you informed, but I can't go much further into detail as each subpoint could deserve its own video. Here's what we will discuss. Nuclear data and radiation, this tritium gaslight, the problem with tritium experiments here in our lab, and then briefly touching upon these subjects, tritium as a radionuclide for molecular labeling, the production of tritium both in the nuclear industry and naturally occurring tritium, alongside some other nice fun facts. And I will continuously have to skip over some things for now, otherwise the video will never end. Regarding nuclear data, once again for everyone, tritium is one of the few isotopes that has its own name. Scientifically it's H3, abbreviated as T. It has a half-life of roughly 12 years and it's a beta minus only emitter. It decays into the very expensive helium-3. The beta particles have an energy of 5.6 kiloelectron volt on average and 18.6 kiloelectron volt maximum. The specific activity amounts to 3.5 times 10 to the power of 5 gigabecquerels per gram. So the remarkable thing about tritium radiation is that it's extremely low energy and consequently rather difficult to measure. Gamma rays cannot be measured because they are non-emitted, but in larger quantities the beta radiation from tritium generates breaking radiation in the material of the container when the electrons are stopped. The chance of beta particles actually passing through the glass casing is extremely low, but I will not completely rule that out. They have a very limited range of a few millimeters in air. With the Como you can actually detect directly that activity is present. How much activity? The clearance or exemption limit in Germany is one gigabecquerel. This is not sufficient to measure anything with conventional detectors. In addition to this gaslight capsule here, we also have a liquid here. This is not water, but it's a standard for scintillation counting. The bottle has a thicker glass wall and much less tritium, which is why we don't measure anything. This is tritium labeled toluene. The scintillation cocktail is already inside the bottle and according to the beta spectrum it's a really low energy beta minus emitter. This sample of tritium label toluene is only suitable for exactly that, calibrating the scintillation counter. More about that in the LSC video, which I will link here. Why is the tritium in this tube and in what form is it contained? The great thing about tritium is it is similar to self-luminescent radium paint, just without any significant radiological danger. In both the radium paint and here in the tritium gaslight capsule, scintillation is utilized. One takes a substance, zinc sulfide in a spherulite mollification, and the electrons of the crystal lattice can easily be excited. Where does the excitation energy come from? From the ionizing radiation of the respective radionuclide. The downside with radium, it is less efficient and therefore more dangerous. Radium decays into radon, which decays further, etc. The total energy from the decay is not in form of particle radiation, but it's emitted in the form of gamma radiation, and this leaves the system. This is practically a loss for scintillation, and it's just additional radiation exposure for the people wearing these radium watches. That does not happen with tritium. The radiation is so low in energy that it can't escape, therefore pretty much all of this contributes to some sort of scintillation. The radium is mixed as a solid in the paint, while the tritium is contained as HT gas inside the capsule. This is why it's in glass. HT is molecular hydrogen, H2, where one of these hydrogen atoms is the radioactive isotope tritium. There is also T2 contained, but producing this is quite difficult and to be honest, I don't think they would make the effort just for some glowing sticks. The HT gas is under 8 times atmospheric pressure inside of this glass tube. Now, there are these glow capsules in various colors, because the scintillation, often referred to as phosphor, even though the element is not contained, is not pure zinc sulfide, but it's doped with some various metals. These metals allow for stepwise energy transitions of the electrons excited by the ionizing radiation. Depending on the metal, one has larger or smaller energy level gaps, which can be overcome by the emission of light. And since the energy difference is related to the wavelength, you get different colors. A wavelength between 450 and 650 nanometers is in the visible range. And this is how these tritium gaslight capsules work. 
the problem with tritium experiments here. There was a paper where they broke these capsules in a closed system allowing the tritium to be released. And then it was chemically converted through oxidation with hot copper oxide to useful HTO, tritiated water. Why tritiated water? Tritium is often used in biology alongside carbon-14 for labeling molecules. I would like to have done that experiment, but we are a low-level beta lab. This means we also do ultra-low-level beta measurements with our LSC. And if 10% of this one gigabacrel of this just one ampule were to be released somehow, the entire lab would have been contaminated. This wouldn't be a radiological danger, but the LSC vials are prepared openly, which would result in some tritium contamination in the air, interfering with our sensitive measurements. This doesn't matter for those working in a beta lab, a background of 10 kilobacrels, who cares? The tritium labeling would result in much stronger radiation and you can quite easily measure mega becquerel amounts with a background that is already in the kilobecquerels amount. They don't care about that. We measure sub becquerel amounts sometimes and these tritium contamination would definitely interfere with our measurements. But again, this would only affect our measurements. This is not a radiological hazard. So if a capsule like this breaks at your home with tritium, it's not a big problem. You would even likely not be able to measure it at all. Now onto applications involving tritium. For biology, tritium labeled molecules are of great importance. Unfortunately, we no longer have a tritium lab in our university, but if you know someone who works with tritium labeled compounds, feel free to send me an email and tell me about it. In this paper, they actually extracted the tritium from the capsules for their labeling purposes. But now there are countless sites where you can order already pre-labeled molecules. For example, here is tritium labeled GABA, which is gamma aminobutyric acid. It's an important neurotransmitter. There's also spicy sugar, meaning tritium labeled D-glucose, with tritium at the second carbon position. Or we have tritium labeled oxytocin. The three and five refers to the third and fifth carbon atoms. And if I counted correctly, the tritium should be there. Looking at this, we should see a trend. Tritium is never located at the very polar bonds in these cases. The tritium is bonded to the carbon atoms. Why? Hydrogen bonds. In hydrogen bonding, hydrogen atoms are regularly exchanged between different molecules and it would be very unfortunate if we were to label an amino group and the tritium would get lost thanks to the hydrogen bonding and reappears as a hydrogen atom of the hydroxyl group of another molecule. Nevertheless, these labeled biomolecules do degrade over time, but such detailed data about the Decomposition are always provided by the manufacturer. Okay, what's next? The production of tritium. Yes, in a type of nuclear power reactor, pressurized water reactors, boric acid is dissolved in the cooling water as a neutron control unit because boron-10 undergoes an N-alpha reaction to become lithium-7 and an alpha particle. This helps absorbing any potential surplus of neutrons. Additionally, lithium hydroxide is added to stabilize the pH of the water to around pH of 9. However, it is important to ensure that the lithium is lithium-7 hydroxide. Natural lithium also contains both lithium-6 and lithium-7, and any lithium-6 present would produce tritium through an N-alpha reaction, leading to unnecessary radiation exposure and contamination. This is why there are vials with pure lithium-6 metal in Marburg. It's just waste from nuclear technology that only requires the lithium-7, and the lithium-6 is just waste. To return to the boron-10, it's not only an N-alpha reaction that takes place, but there is also a much less likely but not negligible reaction called the N2-alpha reaction, where although neutrons are used up, tritium is produced as a byproduct. The primary water itself is hydrogen containing. It typically has a natural deuterium content of 0.015%. These deuterons can also be converted into tritium through neutron activation. Is this relevant? Yes, this is the main source of tritium in the cooling water. For boiling water reactor, 
This is 100 megabecquerels per cubic meter of water. And for pressurized water reactors, it gets up to 10 gigabecquerels per cubic meter. The normal primary water volume is 400 cubic meters. So yes, the tritium activity that accumulates is a bit significant. Going even deeper inside of the reactor, inside of the fuel rods themselves, tritium is also formed there. When a nucleus splits, it is possible not only for two fission fragments to be produced, but also for ternary fission to take place. This is where three fission fragments are created. This can also include tritium as a fission product. The fission yield for uranium-235 is just 0.000108%. And because tritium is so small, up to 1% of this resulting tritium can diffuse into the primary water, even though all fission products should stay within the fuel rods. Tritium also occurs naturally. Atmospheric nitrogen can produce tritium via secondary neutrons from cosmic radiation. Cosmic radiation primarily consists of electromagnetic radiation and protons. When they collide in the atmosphere, they release neutrons, which are then called secondary neutrons part of the broader sense of cosmic radiation. Returning to the topic, tritium is produced through an NT reaction on nitrogen-14 to form carbon-12. This gives a natural tritium abundance of 1 to 10 to the power of minus 18 with proteum, so H1, to tritium. Tritium is also used in other research fields such as neutrino experiments, nuclear fusion and groundwater dating. Yes, I could talk a very long time about this isotope. But let's get to some fun facts. Molecular tritium, so T2, has a boiling point of 25.04 Kelvin. This on itself is quite fascinating that someone had liquid tritium in their apparatus. But tritium is not the only radioactive hydrogen isotopes. It goes as high as 2 hydrogen 7, which was produced at the Riken in Japan using a beam of helium 8. Now I got this question some time ago. Okay, tritiated water is cool, but what happens when it decays? Let's consider HTO instead of T2O. In this case, helium-3 is produced. And helium, as we know, does not form covalent bonds with other atoms. Bond breakage must occur, and that's correct. For example, let's talk about our tritium label toluene. The third edition of the Karl Heinrich Lisa, page 344, provides precise data for this. First, a cation is formed, which then rearranges into the excited tropelium ion as an intermediate, which then decays further. It is important to note that the positive charge is not a result of recoil ionization. The beta energy for tritium isn't high enough for this. But simply it's because of the fact that during beta minus decay, we gain one more proton, and this one more proton is positively charged. This is why we have a positive charge. And this cation decays further. How does this work for HTO? Pretty much just like this. Temporarily, we even have a helium-3 hydroxo cation. But as experiments on molecular tritium have shown, nothing really can be excluded. Not even the formation of a helium-3-2 plus ion and a hydride ion in the case for TH. Similar to this, we can write the decay product from the HTO or the T2O to be pretty much everything. Eventually the charge will balance out, but what would be interesting in my opinion is to know whether T2O water becomes more alkaline over time as it loses free protons through the decay of tritium, which are effectively lost in the form of helium, which isn't measured by the pH. And that's enough as an overview for tritium. A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.